Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. And today we have a battle submitted by Kellorn of the World of Warships podcast. And today, for our viewing pleasure, he is sailing in the... Yes, Kalorn is in the mighty, mighty Yamato. Oh, this can be good. Now, his team do have the battleship advantage. They have one extra tier 8 over the enemy team. The enemy team have the destroyer advantage here on the Shatter map. They have one extra tier 9, the Fletcher. And the Fletcher is a very, very good destroyer. And when you're on a map like Shatter, which is basically just lots and lots and lots of little islands and all kinds of places for destroyers to lurk in ambush, so if you're in a battleship on this map, you pretty much need to be absolutely positive that you know what is or is not on the other side of one of these islands before you go getting too close to it. Battleships on Shatter tend to like to stick to the open sea, where they can see what's coming. Speaking of seeing what's coming, take a look down at the mini-map, specifically Kalorn's surface detection range in the Yamato. He's managed to get it down to 13.5 kilometers. He's obviously running with the Concealment Expert skill, as well as the Stealth module. And you can see that his guns have a range of 26.6 kilometers. And that's before he uses the spotter aircraft that the Yamato comes equipped with, which extends the range of his main batteries by a further 20%. Hang on a minute, does that mean the Yamato can actually stealth fire? Well, no, not really. Well, it can, but it's only going to get the first shot off under ideal circumstances, because when he does fire these monstrous 18.1-inch guns, biggest guns in the game, his surface detection range skyrockets to 27.3 kilometers, and well, here on Shatter, that's basically the whole map. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's nothing subtle about the Yamato when she starts firing her guns. However, under ideal circumstances, it does mean that he should at least be able to get into position to deliver his first broadside undetected. And when you're firing these 18.1 inch guns, that first broadside can often be all that you need. Had a go over there, spotted, sees a Yamato unloaded him, and I suspect his life just flashed in front of his eyes. But, well, he gets lucky. That was missed. He, of course, has not spotted the Akizuki up front, who's firing torpedoes at him, and instead he starts unloading at Kalorn's Yamato. The Atago is about to discover what happens if you're the first ship spotted in Tier 10 battle, particularly if you happen to be a Tier 8 cruiser, and you're given your side to a whole bunch of targets. Oh, hello, New Orleans, Atago, who's he going to go for? Is he going to go for the New Orleans, the Atago, perhaps the Montana that's appeared behind him? Atago, blissfully unaware that he's about to get torpedoed, making it easy for everybody. Who's going to kill him? Is it going to be the torpedoes? Is it going to be the Yamato? It's neither. It's the North Carolina. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> it's not much consolation for the Atago, but I do feel that Cologne was robbed of a kill there. Still, never mind. He's now got the island between himself and the guns of all those enemy ships, which means that, well, they can still lob shells over the island, but they're unlikely to hit anything important, not with the island in the way, and they have to settle for some over-penetrating superstructure hits. And, oh, hello Mr. Gearing, and hello Mr. Kagero, two enemy destroyers spotted, so we're definitely not going to be turning to port around the side of this island and getting closer than we need to to those two destroyers. Instead, we're going to go for the Montana, who is showing an uncomfortably large amount of ankle. <laughs> and um, he's going to pay the price. Yep, that is that is one hell of a paddling. 42,000 damage with two Citadel penetrations. And he's probably not feeling too happy about that, because that's armor-piercing damage. And you can only recover 10% of that with your damage repair consumable. So most of that damage is going to stick, and he is not going to be too pleased with that. Oh, hello. He can get some more shots out. Now the Montana disappeared, but that did look pretty good anyway. And yep, there are the Kagero's torpedoes. Yay, another Citadel. <laughs> and once again, this is all armor-piercing damage. It's not high explosive damage. It's not flooding. It's not fire damage. Battleship damage repair can recover 100% of that kind of damage. Armor-piercing and Citadel damage, on the other hand, that tends to stick. So that Montana is probably feeling pretty upset around about now. The Montana came around the side of the island, realised the Yamato was still pointing his gun straight at him, immediately started turning the ship, learnt his lesson finally, and does manage to avoid a third paddling from Kellorn's 18.1-inch guns and takes minimal damage there, but there are more torpedoes coming in. 
and he spotted the torpedoes because there's nothing out there to spot them for him because he's launched his spotter aircraft. He hasn't done it because he wants the extra 20% range on his main guns. All of these targets are well inside the range anyway. But they did manage to detect the torpedoes on the way in, which means with all that advance warning, there's no way they're ever going to hit him. Those two destroyers, the Gearing and the Kagero, they are not done with Kalorn just yet. Not by a long shot. You can see the spotter aircraft at the moment, it's on the unengaged side of the ship, and there aren't going to be any torpedoes coming from that direction, so until it completes its orbit and it gets around to the engaged side, he's pretty much just going to have to trust the luck and judgement and hope that he doesn't run into any torpedoes. So far, Kalorn has actually had it pretty easy. At the moment, there's only one ship targeting him. I'm not quite sure who it is. It could be one of the destroyers. But pay attention to the location of his spotter aircraft. At the moment, it's on the port side of the ship and it's about to pass ahead. Just caught a glimpse of it there for a second as Kalorn aims up some shots at this New Orleans. New Orleans disappears from view momentarily just as he fires the two forward gun batteries but look at the spotter aircraft just passing over to the starboard side of the ship. And that turns out to be incredibly good timing because here comes the Kagero's torpedoes. He's a persistent little bugger, I've got to give him that much. Kilorn piles on the speed, can't afford to be pulling any fancy manoeuvres now. That's going to slow him down, he's got to try to outrun the arc of these torpedoes. He gets another salvo off against the New Orleans. Is he going to make it? Yes, he's made it. And it's definitely the Kagero because the gearing just got spotted up ahead around the corner of that island. And now there's a increasing number of ships starting to target Kalorn just as the cyclone closes in. Spotting range is now decreased to 8 kilometers, and yet Kalorn is still spotted, still detected, and the number of ships targeting him at ranges well in excess of the 8 km spotting range keeps going up and up and up. It's the Kagero. He's inside 8 km, but he's outside of his own detection range, and he's keeping Kalorn lit up for all of these guys. Now that's an awful lot of ships shooting at Kalorn, but so far it's mostly just been high explosive, and he has been set on fire, but he's got the fire prevention skill, so it's only the one fire midships, even though it looks like two, but now the Montana He's trying to get some revenge, and there's some armor piercing coming in, as well as those torpedoes that Kagero just kept trying. So Kalorn once again manages to avoid the torpedoes and gets himself into partial cover and partial safety behind the side of this island. And while it does look like he's taken a lot of damage here, remember, it's only really the armor piercing damage that sticks. He can recover almost all of that fire and high explosive damage once his damage repair consumable comes off cooldown and it's ready to go. And for the moment at least, the Montana, thirsty for revenge over there, can't actually see him. But that's going to change very, very quickly as just before he fires the guns, he does get detected. Shots out as the Montana disappears. And the fact that he got detected again tells us that either the Kagero is right up there in a direct line between himself and the Montana, or he's skirting around behind him and has just emerged on the other side of that island to the rear, but outside of detection range. So, Kalorn is going to be paying attention to that, and the Montana, still spotted, has not learned his lesson, and is still showing a large amount of skirt there. And you know what that is, boys and girls? Yep, that's a paddling. That's not bad going, he had to do 113,000 damage before he actually got his first kill in this game. The overwhelming majority of that damage, of course, was to the enemy Montana. The Monta he actually finished this game with, I think it was 103,000 damage done to that Montana. Montana doesn't have 103,000 health. What's going on? Well, he would hit the Montana, give him a good paddling. The Montana would heal some of it back. He'd hit him again, give him another good paddling. The Montana would heal a little bit of it back. And it all added up to, well, about 103,000 damage. And for the moment, at least, no, he's no longer spotted. Well, that's a, that's a switch. Oh, hang on a minute. Yeah, here they come. It's that Kagero again. They weren't even close. I think they were highly speculative. So, what's the scores on the doors, Jingles? Well, it's pretty close. Um, Kalorn's team is ahead on points, although both teams have three kills. But, well, Kalorn has managed to sink more valuable ships. The Montana, basically, is worth more points because it's a battleship. So the enemy team are down two cruisers and one battleship, and Kalorn's team is down two cruisers and one destroyer. And that's pretty much it for this flank, except for, of course, our very, very persistent little friend in the Kagero. And then, disaster strikes. 
the enemy team go ahead as they manage to torpedo another ship. And then, just as quickly, <laughs> the scores flip around the other way, and now both teams are down four ships. The problem here, of course, at least as far as Kalorn is concerned, is that the enemy team still have all three destroyers. His team only have the one. Now, the cyclone is in effect, of course, don't forget. Maximum spotting range is reduced to eight kilometers while the cyclone's in effect. And that can result in some hair-raising moments if you're in a destroyer and you wander within 8 kilometers of a Yamato and it suddenly pops up in front of you because you have to react pretty damn quick to ensure that you don't get detected by the Yamato as well. But you do have that window of opportunity in a destroyer. Not so much in a cruiser if you suddenly, in the middle of a cyclone, find yourself wandering within 8 kilometers of a Yamato. <laughs> like that Neptune just did. Now I don't know if the Neptune... Well, the Neptune spotted Kalorn's Yamato, but was the captain of the Neptune paying attention? If he was, and Kalorn is taking this corner awfully wide in an effort to get these guns to bear on the Neptune, but if he was paying attention, and I think it's at this point that Kalorn realises that it's not worth the risk, or as he slows and starts turning and cuts in on the inside of the port side corner of the island up here. Because if that Neptune had been paying attention, the Neptune has torpedoes, and they're not bad, and this is a very, very tight and narrow channel. And, well, at least one is going to hit. And if you take a torpedo on the bow, where there's no torpedo protection, that's flooding. And that means you have to use your damage control ability. So, yeah, it looks like the Neptune was not, in fact, paying attention. So where's he going to be? He's got to be around here to the port side somewhere. Yep, ship spotted. There it is, it's the Neptune. And his guns are not even pointing this way. Of course, that can change very, very quickly in the Neptune. It does have very, very fast-turning turrets. And he was very lucky to not get deleted there. Lost almost all of his health. Two citadels. Two over-penetrations. The rear gun turret was occluded by the corner of the island overhead, but both of the forward turrets were able to fire on the Neptune, of course. Panics. Dumps his torpedoes into the water, but Kelorn obviously knew they were coming. He's hugging the side of the island here. Those are all going to miss. He's popped his smoke, but oh look, there's our little friend in the Kagero. More on him in a moment, because the Neptune's hidden in the smokescreen, which of course means he can't see out of the smokescreen, so Kalorn is undetected. But the Neptune's not going to stay hidden in the smokescreen forever. Somebody flushes him out, I'm not sure if it was with radar or hydroacoustic search, but he's been spotted, and he is just about to get deleted. At more or less the same time as the friendly Minotaur takes out the enemy Hindenburg. So that's another two cruisers sent at the bottom, and that gives Kalorn's team a good 150-point lead. But what's going on with the Kagero? What's he doing over there? Some more torpedoes in the water in the background, possibly, well, almost certainly from the gearing, but what's the Kagero up to? Is he playing chasey-chasey-catchy-catchy, sinky-sinky catchy, catchy, <laughs> around the side of this island? Have a look at what he's doing on the map. He is. He's a persistent little bugger, isn't he? <laughs> He's been chasing Kalorn this entire game. He hasn't managed to land a single torpedo yet. He has to know he's spotted, but do you think he knows that there's a Grosser Kerr first in the North Carolina back here as well? <laughs> and Kalorn, not, let's not forget, and he does have his rear triple 18.1 inch gun battery pointing in this direction. Here he comes. Here he comes. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And shots out. Remember, kids. Cool ships, don't look at explosions. <laughs> and there goes the Kagero. <laughs> well, God loves a Troyer. <laughs> now, right before that Kagero kill, the enemy team just lost their Fletcher and their New Orleans, so Cologne's team are building up a pretty impressive points lead. However, the three remaining enemy ships are all shooting at those two cruisers up there. That's incredibly bad news for the Prince Eugen, because he just got citadel by the Tirpitz and finished off by the gearing. There's also a Yamato over there, which means that Minotaur is in all kinds of trouble. Hold on, Minotaur. Yamato to the rescue. That Minotaur, however, is going to have a real hard time with that amount of health against the Tirpitz, especially since the Tirpitz cannot be torpedoed by the Minotaur. As we're going to see, he's actually using the wreck of the Prince Eugen to shield himself and, yep, the Minotaur's down. Look at that sneaky little German bugger. However, surprise, Yamato! 
17,000 damage. Now the enemy Yamato is actually hidden inside that smoke screen. The enemy Gearing was not in the smoke screen. He's been a real team player and he's dropped his smoke screen to shield the Yamato. And then he ducked around the cover of the island behind him and that's where he ran into the friendly Gearing and got sunk by him. Now judging by the fact that even at this range those torpedoes miss by a good half a kilometer, it's probably fairly safe to say that the captain of this Tirpitz has gone on a full brown alert mode. And who can really blame him when a Yamato, a Grosser Kerfurst and a North Carolina all come steaming out of the smoke and fog this far away from you. In fact he swings the ship around in an effort to get the torpedoes away from the other side, but even they miss by a country mile. And Kalorn slams on the brakes because it wouldn't do to ram him and lose the ship at this stage, unloads another salvo right into the side and the Tirpitz is finished off by the secondaries of the Grosser Kerfurst and that just leaves the Yamato and he's hidden in that smoke screen. But he ain't going to stay hidden forever, because the gearing is charging right into the smoke. And hey presto, any second now. You can see his secondaries firing out of the smoke. And there he is. Broadside on at fairly point blank range where these kind of caliber guns are concerned to a Yamato, a Grosico first, and a North Carolina with a gearing roving up his arse for a spot of surprise torpedo butt sex. And I don't care if you are in a Yamato, if you're sitting broadside on to another Yamato, that is in fact a paddling. And it's the Grosser Kerfurst who finishes off the Yamato on three health with his secondaries for his second close quarters expert medal of that match. Kalorn did 253,000 damage and only got three kills in that game, but that's pretty much because this was very much a team effort. Um, and unsurprisingly, with well over 2,000 base experience, he was the MVP of his team. MVP of the enemy team, however, commiserations have to go to that Gearing, who got three kills of his own, used his smoke screen unselfishly to try to keep his team alive, but it, well, it just wasn't enough, was it? So commiserations to him. Most persistent player of the match award, however, has to go to the enemy Kagero, whose dogged pursuit of Kalorn's Yamato all the way across the map before his untimely demise shortly before the match ended netted him a grand total of 217 experience. <laughs> I wonder if he thinks it was worth it. <laughs> Possibly not. Anyway that's it for today uh, in World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. I hope you've been entertained by that battle. I certainly was. Kellorn, once again thank you for sending that replay in and everybody else as always take care and I'll catch you next time.